Good afternoon, everyone. Certainly appreciate the special music. You know, most people think that the words complete and finished are the same. I disagree with that. I asked my wife last night, did she know the difference between complete and finished? And she was talking, I don't know, I didn't understand her. So I tried to explain it to her. I said, if you marry the right person, you're complete. If you marry the wrong person, you're finished. So there is a difference. <laughs> it's like that man was on the plane, <clears throat> and he was uh, taking a business trip, and he noticed the other guy sitting beside him. He said, say, mister, you know you have the ring on the wrong finger? He said, that's because I married the wrong woman. <laughs> married the wrong woman? I said, yes, I married the wrong woman. Matter of fact, I divorced her seven times. And married the right, uh, right, wrong woman again seven times. I said, how did that happen? I said, well, every time I'd go to bed, uh, she wouldn't let me sleep. And she'd wake me up every morning with a cold bucket of water in my face. So the man said, that's awful. He said, well, what really broke the ice was that uh, I was sleeping and she threw a cat in bed with me. He said, that's horrible. He said, it is when you're sleeping with a dog. So, so <laughs> married the wrong woman, I guess. Well, he brought back old members when Mr. McNair was in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, that was my home church, my family. We attended that in March 1963. And we had uh, 450 people attending that church. Now, the reason it wasn't uh, raised up before, because they did not have the ministers. And uh, they had a lot of people who were called, a lot of people who were studying, had a lot of people taking the Bible correspondence course, but they didn't have any ministers that where we could assemble together with. I first heard the telecast, a broadcast in 1960. And we were talking a while ago, Dr. Pierre and I were talking. I said, what an honor, a privilege and blessed we are to know the truth. That we can go to bed tonight and we understand if we don't wake up, we'll be in God's kingdom. We understand a lot of things we may just take for granted and not understand it. Now, before I was called, I was afraid to go to sleep, afraid I would wake up in hell and burn forever. And you can imagine what a nightmare that would have been just what a relief it is to know you're not going to heaven. Relief you know there's no such thing as a burning hell forever and ever. Relief to know that you have no immortal soul. All of those things we've been set free from. From those uh, lies that we were told. What if Dr. Meredith were to go down to this Calvary Baptist Church, that pink church, you know, where they have all... So many people, he'd go in and say, I know Jesus may be your Savior, but who's your father? Now, he wouldn't last long if he were to answer that question. They would persecute him and all. So this afternoon, I want to talk about a subject that's been around before time. Been around before man was created. It all started back in what we would call eternity. And this sin is lying. And I believe lying is next to the unpardonable sin. We live in a world that is filled with lies. Very difficult to believe people today. Very difficult to believe the salesman or the products you buy. Very difficult to trust anybody in our society today. They've lost confidence in our government. They've lost confidence in the IRS. They feel like they've been lied to. So they don't know who to trust. And so we understand, God's people, that we're coming out of that kind of attitude or that kind of life that we used to live in, for instance. Now, one well-known economist said, the test of a nation is the growth of its people, physically, intellectually, spiritually, and family. Now, we could say the same thing about the church of God, can't we? The test of the church of God is the test of his people. 
if they're growing physically, intellectually, spiritually, and family. So that would be the test for all of us. We come here in the afternoons, the mornings, attend services to hear the truth. Not to be lied to, but hear the truth. Whether we like it or not, we hear, we want to hear the truth. And so we do preach the truth. We understand the truth. And that's why we quote scriptures and say, turn with us to this here, or turn with us to this page, and we read the truth. And so we understand those things and understand how important the church is. Now, Mr. Dr. Meredith's fine message two weeks ago, the importance of a family, brought back old memories to me. Back when I was a young lad, and I'm sure some of you remember the parents of old, my daddy told me, said, son, don't lie. Pay your bills, and don't you lie. Don't you ever lie to me, and that'll take you a long way. So we were brought up to try to tell the truth the best we could, what truth we knew at that time, and pay our bills. We learned to do that in our society. When I was 11 years old, I had a paper route. I served two, uh, 75 houses, and after I finished the paper route, I had a little credit at this little grocery store. And I'd go by there every afternoon after I delivered the papers and get a pint of chocolate milk. So I'd say, charge it. <laughs> so this man put it on paper. I said, look, I'll pay you at the end of each week. I'll come by and pay you. So I did. I kept my word to him, and I paid my bills to him. Now, he didn't send a bill collector after me. He didn't call me up and say, you're behind on your chocolate milk price. But he trusted me. He gave me the opportunity, 11-year-old young man, to keep my word and pay my bills. See? And I have never forgotten that at all. Now, the American society today has forgotten all of that, where you pay your bills and you keep your word. And they put all this money out before you go borrow it, you know, and you can pay it back and you can do this. And first thing you know, people get in debt, they can't pay the bills. And it makes them lie. They have to come up with some excuse why they can't do it. And that's the society that we're living in and that we understand. Now, another prominent writer said, America is becoming a nation of liars. Well, what makes a person lie? What is it that makes him lie? It's easy to live a lie. It's easy to tell a lie. It's very difficult to tell the truth, very difficult to live the truth because you're persecuted if you tell the truth, you're looked down on if you tell the truth, and so we understand that. Now, the Bible plainly shows that God is not a liar. You can read that in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, that God is not a liar. It's impossible for God to tell the tr uh, to lie. We understand that. And when he made the promises to Abraham, Abraham had to believe the truth. He had to believe that truth, that God could not lie. He had to believe that as his dealings with God. So he died believing God's word, that God would keep his word to him and to his seed after him. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 23. Numbers 23. We know the story of Balak and Balaam. In verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie. See, God is not a man. Now, even Balak, or Balaam knew that man was capable of lying and not telling the truth and living a lie. Nor a son of man, God is not a son of man, that he should repent, has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. So God is truth. And brethren, how many of us truly believe that? I mean, honestly believe that, that God is truth. 
that Jesus Christ is the head of his church. And Jesus Christ said he would never leave his church. How many of us truly believe that? Well, look how many people have left simply because they thought maybe Christ lied, that he's not the head of the church, that it's some man's church. It's easy, you see, to get involved in something that would put a doubt in your mind that would cause you then to disbelieve God who says, I cannot lie. Christ is the head of the church. Christ has placed his ministry in his church. They will not lie in the pulpit. They tell the truth. We understand that. We are going to have to remember that as time goes on, that Christ is the head of the church. He is our head. God is our Father who cannot lie. We have to believe that. If not, we may give up in the heat of the battle. Sometimes we feel like, well, God doesn't hear my prayer. He's not healing me. God cannot lie. See, it is up to God. It's his time. God is truth. Man is a liar. God is truth. Man is capable of lying. God is not. We have to remember that as time goes on. And some of you young people need to remember that. God cannot lie and will not lie as we understand it. So Jesus came and revealed then the liar. Let's turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I think all of us know these verses. But notice how much courage it took for Jesus to tell the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who were supposed to have been the religious leaders of that day, thought they were good, they thought they were fine, and they did not understand what Jesus was about to say to them. In verse 44 of John 8, You are your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources, for he is the liar and the father of it. So he was telling the Pharisees that Satan was their father, not God. Satan was their father. And that took a lot of courage on his part to tell them that, that you're not of God, you're not if you did, you would believe me. You would hear the truth. The truth would set you free. But you are of your father, the devil. Now, that's hard for us to understand those things, isn't it? That's powerful, powerful stuff. When people tell you that you're going to heaven when you die, or going to hell when you die, or you have an immortal soul, or Christmas and Easter, what a, well, whose father is that? Who is the author of that? Well, it's not God the Father. It's not Christ. But we know that they have not been called at that time. We know they're in the image of God but have the mind of Satan. They're made in the image of God. They have a satanic mind because that's all they know. That's all I knew before I was called. I didn't know the truth. I believed what everybody told me. I did what, I, what, what felt good to me. I lived a lie until the truth came and convicted me of that lie that I was living. And I lived a lie. Pretend to be one thing, but I was another. I'd go to church and I'd act good, but I was a sinner. Couldn't wait to get out, to go fishing or whatever. I was living a lie and didn't even know I was lying. I thought I was telling the truth. I thought I was brought up in telling the truth, see. But I didn't know the truth. And that's the beautiful thing about God's truth, that we understand it. Now let's turn to Isaiah 14 and see how it all started. Isaiah 14. 
talking about this Lucifer who became the devil. How are you fallen from heaven? Verse 12 of Isaiah 14. O Lucifer, the son of the morning. Well, he was the light bringer, wasn't he? He was the son of the morning, the light bringer. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, or you have said in your heart. Now notice how he started lying to himself. He started believing he was more than what he was created to be. He didn't understand what he was. So he wanted to be something different, something more powerful in his heart. He began to think he was more important than God. He said, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, we call it vanity, but I'm saying he was lying to himself. They created that vanity. He thought of himself more highly than he should, should have. He was not created to be a god. He was created to be a cherub, anointed cherub, a covering cherub. That was his job, to bring the truth to the third of his angels who were on the earth at that time. Then this is what he began to say, On the farther sides of the north I will send above the heights of the clouds. Well, who's going to stop me now? I want to get ahead. I'm going to cut somebody in the back. I need to be God. I'm not satisfied being a cherub. See? And that's not fair that I can't be God. And God doesn't want to share. And we can say a lot of things, but he said, You shall be brought down to the lowest depths of the pit. So let's go now to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Moreover, verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Eternal came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus saith the Eternal God, you were the seal of perfection, full of beauty, perfect in beauty. Now we had described about the, you know, the trees, how perfect they are, the limbs, how perfect they are. Here was a perfect being, probably one of the finest God could create. A perfect, beautiful being. Full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in the Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And he started naming the stones. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. He was a created being. God is not created, you see. God has always existed. Satan, or Lucifer, was created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you, you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You had access. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity. See, till iniquity was found. So his attitude was take and get. I'm going to take God's throne. I'm going to get what I want. That was his attitude. He lied to himself. He became the father of lies, lying to himself first. I deserve more. I need more. And we see that in his world today. People want to get ahead. They have books on how to succeed. They tell you how to stab people in the back, how to get ahead, lie, cheat, whatever it takes to get ahead. And people do that today. I'm not saying any of us do that, but uh, that's what you did when I was growing up, working in the public work. You lied, you cheated, whatever you had to do to get ahead at that time. That's just the way Satan's world is. That's the way he was. And he should know. So he lied. The first lie was take and get. He was not created to be God, but yet he wanted to take God's seat. Probably he thought he knew the better way. He said, now if I could just unionize these angels, unionize them, see. Well, how long did it take him then to convince the angels 
that he should be God, that third of the angels. How long did it take him, you think? Was it overnight? We don't have time, can't measure that, but it took him a long time to convince those angels to follow him. We unionize ourselves. We get what we want. If not, we'll strike. And so Satan here then did convince the angels that he should be God. A third of them, that he should be God. Yet instead of bringing the truth to them, he started lying to them that God is unfair. God is unjust. He's got all those, that universe out here, and we have this one little planet. That's not fair. See. Now, I'm just saying, I don't know what he said, but that you look at the world, his world, and that's usually what they say. See. That's usually what they say, you know, his sons out in the world, that's what they say. God is not fair. The boss is not fair. The company is not fair. The church is not fair. It's just not fair. If I were in charge of the church, I'd run it differently. Now, if I could only be in charge, and I've been around for a long time. I've heard people say that. I've heard people plotting against the, you know, against the leadership of the church. I've heard them plot Pasadena, Dr. Mayor's heard them, plot, heard them plot, and it takes time to convince somebody that that individual should not be in charge. You can't do it overnight. And first thing you know, they get the line to themselves. And first thing you know, then, where do they go? Back to the world. Back out there. Instead of staying with the truth, Instead of saying, I prove that God is the head of the church, I proved at baptism that there's only one church of God. I proved there's only one calling. I approve that. I've proven that. And so they get all tangled up. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, by the time Satan got to Eve, he was in such a habit of lying, he got incapable of even speaking the truth. Apparently, Genesis chapter 3. He was already a liar. Verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the eternal God had made. And he said to the woman, As God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree of which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, God didn't say that if you touch it, you're going to die. He said, If you did eat of that fruit, it will lead to death. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. You see, there was a lie. He tried to contradict God. God said, you will die. Satan says, you won't die. So she had a choice to make. Who is she going to believe? God of truth or Satan the liar? A choice that she had to make. And she made the choice because she believed then she would be a God. So Satan sells the idea that you are a God. You know right from wrong. Nobody's going to tell you what to do. You know what to do. You make your own rules up. Now, I've visited people. They say, well, Mr. League, nobody's going to tell me what to do. This is my house. I said, that's true. I'll make decisions which way my family's going to go. Instead of listening to God, I'll make decisions. I am a God. See, small g. I am a God. And you see that everywhere. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. See? And that's why God says, I am God, and there's no one else. You're not a God. I'm God. So the whole attitude is repenting of that attitude, that I know everything. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I should be more than what I am. Why are they holding me back? Why don't they let me do this? Don't they know who I am? That's his human nature 
for you. So they, when he said, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So you will be like God. You will make your own decisions. You don't have to listen to anybody else. And uh, see, that's the way Satan was. So lying began to eat on Satan's character. The devil is still convinced that he should be God. And he's convincing everybody else that they should be God. See, trying to convince them as well. We know Satan is the God of this world because uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that he is the God of this world. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who is, who is sins, he who sins is of the devil. It's just that plain, isn't it? He who sins or practice sins is of the devil, not of God. Those who practice righteousness or God's way of righteousness is of God. But he who sins or practice sins lies to himself, pretends to be something he's not or she is of the devil because that's what the devil is. He's lied to himself. He practices sin or lies, as we see. So everything in the world is based on a lie, brethren. I know that may sound harsh and heavy, but that is true. It's based on a lie. The devil is, still believes he uh, should be God. Politics is based on lies. Get ahead, lie to the people, promise them anything, deliver nothing. You can't get somebody up there but be honest but never get elected. You have to be a good liar. People like to believe lies. See, they want to hear lies. Maybe not everybody, but I mean those who are running for office. Religions, aren't they based on lies? Were they founded on truth? Founded on a lie? See. And when you go to Sunday church... And you say, the Sabbath day is the day you should keep. Oh, it doesn't matter which day you keep. Are they lying to themselves? Do they believe the God of truth? Do they believe all of that? Now, I have to deal with that all the time from telephone calls I receive at headquarters. And I mention to them, you can't keep Monday holy. You can't keep Sunday holy. God did not make it holy. We cannot make anything holy. No church can make anything holy. We keep something's holy, what God has made holy. That's what we keep. Now, if you think Sunday is the day that God keeps holy, that's fine. That'd be fine if you think that. Because you're not going to convince them if they believe that, that lie. It takes the truth to set them free. And only God can put the truth in their minds. And understand that. Don't you think most businesses today is founded on a lie? Competition. Buy one, get one free. They're up the price. You think, boy, what a bargain I got here. You save $25. I see I'd probably buy me a loaf of bread. You know, they tell you how much you save, but you spend $150. <laughs> you know, in these situations. Education. Think about the education today. Is that based on a lie? Isn't same-sex marriage a lie? Isn't abortion a lie? Isn't all that a lie? And that's been sold to the people today, especially young people. It's all right. Feels good. Do it. Fornicating is nothing wrong with that. Shacking up is nothing wrong with that. Don't use that word shack, shack up because it's too vulgar. Let's get something more sweet, see. Isn't that a lie? Evolution is not a lie. They can't teach God. They can't teach the Bible. Satan has taken over that system. 
And we began to see that. So a lot of our parents then have decided, I don't want my children exposed to all those lies. So they teach them at home. Okay. And it's getting worse. Okay. It's not better. And I don't think you can stop people. You cannot stop people today from doing what they want to do. So we understand, brethren, God's church, we have to be careful not to let Satan get to us in any way. We cannot be ignorant of his devices. He's a liar and the father of it. And all someone has to do is put a doubt in your mind, just a doubt there. And that begins to spread. You begin to question then what you believe. You begin to question these things. And it's just that people, well, they're changing this, they're changing that. It couldn't be God's church anymore. So I'm leaving it, or I'm going to cause a problem. It couldn't be God's church because they're changing this, changing that, changing this, and changing that. Well, the whole world is changing out there. We're not changing truth. But that's the way it starts. Okay. To introduce different ideas in truth. Bring in a little leavening in truth. Okay. Just a little bit. Or compromising just a little bit of God's truth. It's the way it starts. It erodes character. It ro erodes the mind. So David knew that he was capable of lying. And what did he do about it? Well, Psalms 119, you turn with me to Psalms 119. Now, I know that I'm capable of lying, and I have to watch that I don't lie. I have to watch that I don't exaggerate numbers or make myself look good. I have to watch that. Because that's the way I am. I know what I am. So David remembered who he was. In verse 29, remove from me the way of lying. So that is, was his prayer. My prayer as well. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. So he wanted to walk in God's truth, and he realized he was capable of lying. He wanted that uh, be removed from him. And as long as we walk by the law of God, we're going to be fine. But we also have to watch these other things we have. Exaggerating. Not keeping a promise. I don't want some of you know that I'm not bragging on myself, but... Uh, if I said I'm going to come to see you at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, and if I'm early, you know, I usually call you. I said, I'm here early. Do you mind if I come on over? Or if I say I'm stuck in traffic or some un unforeseen circumstance happen, I'll call and say, look, I'm going to be a few minutes late. I don't want you to worry. I'm still on my way. That relieves them. See, not standing there in the window peeping all the time. Saying, when you, when's he going to come? <laughs> so it only takes just a, the thoughtfulness, keeping your word, and sometimes you can't do it, but you don't make it. You just tell the other person why you can't do it at that time. See? And understanding that. <clears throat> now let's notice the reaction of Saul back in 1 Samuel chapter 15, 1 Samuel 15. Samuel also said to Saul, The Eternal sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel, to set you over Israel, Israel's leader. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Eternal, which means pay careful attention to what I'm about to say. God has a job for you. This is a very important job that God has given you as king of Israel. Now, therefore, uh, verse 2, Thus saith the eternal of hosts, I will punish Amalek for that what he did, how he ambushed him, Israel out of the way, 
uh, on the way when he came out from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek, utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nurse and child, ox and sheep and camel and donkey. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? I mean, it's obvious what he was supposed to do. Now God could have done it because he was going to do it, but he allowed Saul to do it for him. Let him do the work. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them. Oh, he had about 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul, verse 5, Saul came to the city of Amalek, lay in wait in the valley. And, and the, Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart down from the, among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. Verse 9, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything, everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Now, you see, now he was the king of Israel, anointed king of Israel, to carry out God's truth, to carry it out. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set you up as king, for he has turned back from following me, has not performed my commandments. Is that what John said? He that saith, I know him, and keep not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Was Saul here lying to himself? Was he convinced that he, should, he knows more than God? Did he convince himself that he, that's what God would want? Well, he was lying to himself. And when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Saul, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. That's how great he was, a monument for himself. And he has gone on around and passed by and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are the Lord, I have performed the commandments, the commandments of the eternal. Now, how could he come to that conclusion? I mean, how did he do that? To come to the conclusion, I have done what God said. See, he was a liar, and God knew he was a liar. God knew he could be trusted. He had already taken over Samuel's uh, duty as priest. Well, you know, the people made me do it. You weren't here, so the people, I had to bless the people. He was a liar. Now, that's what the people, people chose him. They wanted a king like Saul. They didn't want God, the God of truth. They wanted Saul to be the king. So they got what they wanted. Just like a politician you vote for what you get, basically for people like you, or the way you think. Are they going to change society? Are they going to do this? Chicken in every pot, car in every garage, free education for everybody, free medical. That sounds good. But they can't deliver. Who's going to pay for it? They don't tell you that. So people believe a lie, and they get sucked up in a lie. Then they become disappointed in the very one they elected. Wonder why did we elect him? Then Saul said, uh, I mean, Samuel said, what's all those sheep I hear down there? See? Well, the people made him do it. The people. Now, I'm pretty sure that Dr. Meredith is not going to please the people and say, well, God, people made me do this, made me change the Sabbath. The people did. I had to change it to keep the people in. I'm pretty sure we couldn't take a pitchfork <laughs> and make him change. That's the, see, in God's church, it's, it's God of truth. We deliver the message that God has given us to, to deliver. Go into all the world as a witness, 
to all nations, to all nations. Preach to everybody, not just a few, everybody. You reach everybody in those nations, and then the end, end shall come. So we try to comply with that in that situation. But I remember in Worldwide, back in 1969, or that they changed the target. They thought, well, we need to reach the highly educated people. Instead of just preaching the, the message to all nations, to all peoples, a few was targeted. The message changed a lot in the tomorrow in the plain truth. It changed. Then God put Mr. Armstrong, you know, when he had that heart failure, God brought him back to life, and Mr. Armstrong put the church for 10 years back on track, preaching that message of the gospel of the kingdom of God, as God intended. You can't change God's message. See, It's there. And we understand that as God's people, that we can't change it. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, Colossians 3, verse, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with the de his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So in the church of God, we should tell each other the truth. See? Speak the truth to each other. Be able to tell the truth, even though it might hurt sometimes. We still teach the truth. Now, there's what you call kind lie, as people say. Kind lie is, I know exactly how you feel. See, nobody knows how another person feels. That person knows. We think we know. And we sympathize, but I'm not saying that's a, just a deliberate lie. I'm just talking about sometimes we, we say things to encourage people. But I think you understand what I'm talking about. There are certain things that we, condolences and all, and understanding. Let's turn now to Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 25, therefore putting away lying, let each of you speak the truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one another, which means then, brethren, we keep our promise, we keep our appointments, we tell each other the truth, we don't keep somebody waiting, that we care about that individual no matter who he is. We keep our word to an individual. And that leads to perfection, the way we become perfect. If we keep the word, the appointments, always tell the truth. It is the way to perfection. Leviticus 19, verse 11 says, uh, don't lie one to another. See? You never want to be a person that can never be trusted. Well, they said they're coming over, but I don't know if they will or not. I don't know whether to go buy food for them. I don't know if they come over or not. Okay, some circumstance may arise that you can't, but you need to let people know that we don't lie one to another, that we don't take, take each other for granted, that you are special in God's sight, you are the truth, and we tell the truth. We speak of the truth in those situations. You know, Exodus 20 talks about don't bear false witness. Don't pass on rumors, as we heard last week in the sermon. Don't make snap judgments. Don't judge a person's character unless you know. You, you know, if someone gets drunk, you're not judging the person. You see the fruit of it. But the intent is what we need to be careful about. We all have come from different cultures. Every one of us are different. I've come from the South, some have come from the North, some have come from Mexico, some have come from, you name it, different cultures. 
And we expect probably everybody to fit into our culture, see, our culture, the way we see things. Now, I was brought up in the South to do this, so I expect the Northern people to do that as well. We expect all of that. We have one image for self and an, an image for somebody else. And that image of somebody else is what I like to see them change, to fit my image. So that truth is what sets us free. And if you're a man or a woman to your word, you're highly respected. They highly respect you. Get ahead in the world. You get ahead in your community. If you're well respected, your word is good. You love your neighbor, next door neighbor, the other door neighbor. So he's just showing here that we are to love our neighbor by speaking the truth and loving in the truth. In Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs 6. Now three of these abominations, there are seven that God hates, but three of them is lying. Verse 16, these six things the, the eternal hates, yes, even under, are abomination to him. Seven are abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. So God hates that. God is truth. Satan is a liar. Satan divides by telling lies. He divides by doing that. He keeps us apart from doing that. Where God is truth. When I was baptized in 1963, the minister asked me, had I, have I proven God exists? I said, yes, sir. Have you proven the Bible? I said, yes, sir. Have you proven where the true church is? I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you believe the gospel? I said, yes, sir. Which I had. I have never changed from that. I've had people call me up before and say, where do you stand, Mr. League? I said, I stand where I stood at baptism. I have proven God exists. His word, the Bible is his word. I have proven where his church is, what they would be doing. I have proven all of that. And I'm still in the church that I have proven to be God's church, preaching the gospel, who God is, what he is. The Bible is his written word. His promises are sure. So I've never deviated from that. I don't think I've ever went to a minister and said, I, I believe I disagree with the church. Now, it might be something I don't, I don't understand, but disagreeing something I've already proven. I'm saying I think I disagree with Christ. It's his church. He's building his church. I, I think I'm disagreeing with him. Now, how would that look if I were to go before Christ and say, I disagree with you, Christ? You say, you do. Well, who are you anyway? I don't believe I know you. Now, people have accused the church of dictating everything, who to date, who to marry, what to eat, what to drive, what to... All this done is teach. It's up to individuals then to examine themselves to see whether or not they want to comply in modesty, in modesty, certain things. Now, since I've been in the church, things have been corrected. A lot of things have been corrected since I've been in the church, which has been good, but the truth has never been corrected. It's the truth except Mr. Armstrong changed, as you have all know, Pentecost and DNR. But other things we did, or I'm not saying headquarters did it, but the field ministry, a lot of them did because they didn't understand. 
And uh, so those things were changed for the good. Like we don't come around and see if you got white sugar <laughs> or, white, or white bread anymore. Now, you see, you can't blame the church for that. Some individuals might have had that uh, concept. May have that concept, but when you lump everybody in it together, how could it be God's church if they're doing this? So we have to be very careful in these situations. In Matthew chapter 12, Matthew 12, verse 36, But I say to you, for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Wouldn't the idle word be that we fail to keep our promise? Wouldn't that be idle? Wouldn't it be if we go before God and say, I'm going to change that, and we don't? Wouldn't that be an idle word? Come home for the feast, say, God, I'm going to turn over a new leaf in my life. And we tend to forget about it. Is that idle? Wouldn't we be judged by what we say? So that's why that everybody has to be careful what he says. Does he really mean it? Is he willing to pay the price? Is he willing to ro roll up his sleeve and make those changes? So when you t James 3.1 talks about a minister has to be very careful what he teaches. He's judged by what he teaches. He's got to teach the truth. He's got to teach that. Why he's under du double judgment. You just can't get him a pullman saying the thing that comes off the top of your head. We're judged by our words, by our actions. And if we keep our word to you, then you will trust us more, and we will trust you more. It's a two-way trust that we keep God's way of life. <clears throat> Every sin can be traced back to a lie, when you think about it, back to a lie. When one lie is told, another must be told to cover the first lie. I've seen, you know, my sister, <laughs> my daddy knew she was lying, and he just kept on her, and you could just tell, he said, look me in the eyes. He said, she couldn't look him in the eyes and, t and, and save. She just kept trying to tell a lie, a lie, another lie, and another lie, justifying herself, why she did that, why she didn't do that. And finally she said, Daddy, I'm just going to tell you the truth. Well, did my daddy whip her? No. He had mercy on her. She confessed the truth that he knew all along that she had lied about that. I've heard people say, well, I stole something in a grocery store. My daddy found out about it and made me take it back Tell the person I stole it. That's a, good, that's a good punishment, isn't it? Sir, I stole a bar of candy out of your store. Here, here it is back. So the truth is what you remember. And you don't want to do the sin over anymore because you remember the truth, the truth of God, or the truth uh, as, as you know it in society. So we can always trace back that. In 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, but just think about in God's world, there would be no liars. If I tell the truth, you trust everybody at that time because they've been proven. Their word is good, God's word in them. If someone says, verse 20, I love God and hates his brother, what does God, John, say? He is a liar. Okay. Now, we didn't put that in there. Is there anybody here that you hate? Okay. 
Well, I don't know of anybody I hate. But he says, if I say I love God and hate his brother, I'm a liar. Now, that's hard to swallow, isn't it? For he who does not love his brother whom he sees has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And if please ask these chapter 5. Please ask these chapter 5. Verse 1 of walk prudently when you go to the house of God. And draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. See? So when a person comes before God, he has to be very careful how he comes in the presence of God. See? Do not be rash with your mouth, that not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you on earth, therefore let your words be few, for a dream comes through the most much activity. And a fool's voice is known by his many words. There are some people that can't quit talking. They can't stand silence. They just talk, 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 talk. And they're known by those words. And so we have to be careful that we don't do all the talking, that we have to do the listening sometimes and understanding. So when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. And that's your wedding vow, that's your baptismal vow, whatever vow we make to God, God holds us to that, to that vow. So this applies to baptism, marriage, keeping our word, carrying out what we say. When we lie, really we're following Satan's philosophy unless we can explain to somebody. Now, I'm not saying it's always easy to carry out a vow. Uh, of another person, a marriage. It takes two people to do that, to do that. So if two people are sincere and they make a vow before God, God expects them to tell that truth, hold on to that truth. So I've been married 61 years. It has been easy, as my wife would tell you, to live with me for 61 years. <laughs> But we made a vow to each other 61 years ago. Okay. Made a vow. As I mentioned, my daddy taught me, and her mother taught her, stay with your word. Keep your word. See? Keep your word at all costs. And so we've tried that. We've done our best to do that. So let me just... Seven ways that we lie. Deliberate lies. One's deliberate. Remember Ananias and Sapphire? Now here they were involved in this holding, uh, selling their possessions. They probably, on the day of Pentecost, they were involved in that. They sold the possession, but they kept, uh, kept part of it back. So Peter asked a question, you did not lie to man, but you lied to the Holy Spirit. And they were killed on the spot. They deliberately lied. They didn't have to. It was theirs as long as, uh, but once they pretended or lied about that, they were killed on the spot. And that's how serious that was at the beginning of the church. So we have deliberate lies. And it was the same way of Aaron. Remember, Aaron said, I got all the gold. Let's put it all in the fire. Wow, this calf jumped out. <laughs> Just jumped out. See? And this is the calf that will lead us back to Egypt. Or distract the truth. Or dis, you know, distrust uh, the truth. Deception where we exaggerate things, build things up that are not real. And we're warned about that in Romans 12. Notice Romans 12. Verse 
verse 3. For I say through the grace of given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So that takes discipline to realize that God is the one that does promoting. Now, I might try to get ahead, but what good would it do? In the end, what good does it do? It's God is the one that promotes us. It's God's the one that sets us in the church. It's God is the one that does these things for us. So Satan thought of himself too highly. Should be God. He could do a better job than God. And yet Paul is showing here that we need to think soberly about self. Now, we don't know what we can do until we're given the opportunity to do it. Sometimes you give an opportunity to do something, you don't think you could do it. But God gives you the expertise or the will or, or the education that you need to do what he has for you. So in Galatians chapter 6, verse 3, For if someone, anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. The flesh is nothing. So deception, exaggerating, flattery, insincere praise is another way. Four is failure to keep promises. So we break our promises to our children. Do we break them to our children? Or we tell them why we can't do it? Putting things off. Impunity. Uh, imputing wrong motives when we know better. Stating personal opinions instead of facts. But we don't have the facts on something, our personal opinion. It is my opinion. Based on what? Am I living a lie? Do I live by God's word? Is my heart in God's work? See, that's the question, isn't it? Now, the basic cause is for lying. We don't think about what we're saying. You know, it just jumps out. We say without thinking. Sometimes we say the wrong thing. We say, why did I say that? That was not true. Why did I make that statement? So it helps us to see that we need to think before we speak sometimes. Think it through. Basic cause of lying is habit. Off-the-cuff promises. Well, I'll get that for you. Well, I'll do it right now. See? And we don't do it. Try to impress others by eagerly trying to serve. We're just trying to serve. Not everybody, but serve those that you want, want to get ahead. They can help you get ahead. Where we serve the widows, we serve everybody in the church. We're no respect to persons. We take care of everybody. I don't know if any widow can help me, see, give me, advance me in any way. But we serve everybody, see, not pick and choose. Making big promises, like saying, I get it, I'll get, to, get it done just as soon as I can. Then unforeseen circumstances has come up, and that's when you tend to call the individual then and let them know that you won't be able to make it at the time you said, but let them know why. Proverbs 19. So as I heard in the sermon that we're in a war. Spiritual war. It's a battle. Lie and truth. That's the key. It's a battle between the two. It's difficult to obey the truth. It's easy to obey a lie. Very difficult to obey truth. It's not part of us. It is now. It's becoming more part of our thinking, of our doing. 
Proverbs 19, verse 5, A false witness will not go unpunished. He who speaks lies will not escape. In verse 9, A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies shall perish, as we understand. So if we can't remember our promise, we need to write it down. You write down the appointment, write down certain things so you don't forget. And that way you're always on the way to perfection. You want to keep your word. Sometimes you can't remember it, so you write it down as much as you can. So I, I realize that that's the world we're living in. It's more difficult to believe people out in the world. We don't want that to come into church or we distrust the ministry, or distrust what God is doing for us. We want to support the truth, and God will bless us if we do. And we look forward to the time when Satan is put away. All liars will be, all liars will be put away. We don't have to worry about that anymore. So let's keep up the good work, and doing God's truth leads us to perfection.